Hello and welcome back to another video. So today I've got another full PC build guide for you and I'm going to be showing you step by step how to put all these parts I've got in front of me together to come up with a fully working PC. So today's build is going to be a mini ITX build which is great if you've got a limited amount of space on your desk. So let's have a look at the parts. So for the case I've gone with Leon Lee's TU150 and this isn't a relatively new case but there hasn't been anything that's come along that's made me want to pick something more modern. And one of the big advantages of this case are that you can fit a really large CPU killer up to a maximum height of 165 millimeters. You can fit long graphics cards up to 320 millimeters, and it's got a lovely handle at the top, which just pops up and down, adding a bit of portability to the case. For the motherboard, I've got one with the B550 motherboard from MSI. It's the B550 iGaming Edge Wi-Fi. And one of the nice things about this motherboard is it has an internal USB Type-C header. And our TU150 has a USB Type-C header on the front panel, so it's going to work really well. And a lot of you may not realise, but actually it's very rare to find an internal Type-C header on an X570 Mini ITX motherboard. So it's one of the nice things that B550 Mini ITX motherboards have brought. For the CPU, I've gone with the Ryzen 7 3700X. This is an 8-core CPU, which will be very comfortable for gaming, but also with content creation and multitasking. So AMD are hopefully going to be releasing new Ryzen CPUs shortly, so if you do get one of the new CPUs, the guide should hopefully be fairly similar to follow along. So keeping the CPU cool, I've gone with Noctia's top-of-the-line killer, the NHD15 Chromex Black Edition. So this CPU killer should do a great job keeping our Ryzen 7 3700X cool. And it should just about fit in this case when you look at the compatibilities. So it's great we've got a mini ITX case that we're able to fit a top-of-the-line our cooler into. If you do want to go down the I.O. route, this case does support a 120mm I.O. But when you compare 120mm I.O. to a premium air cooler like this, the air cooler is probably going to provide better temperatures and also run quieter as well. For RAM, I've got 32GB of Triton Z Neo at 3600MHz speed. Powering the whole build, I've got an SFX power supply from Corsair. It's the SF750. For the GPU, I've gone with the RTX 2070 Super. And although the NVIDIA 3000 series cards have been released, they're still not available to buy. So again, if you're watching this video when the new cards are available, feel free to swap the graphics card out. For storage, I've picked up two Sabrent Rocket 1TB NVMe M.2 SSDs, and this motherboard supports two M.2 SSDs. The front socket will support up to a Gen 4 SSD, so feel free to swap out for a Gen 4 drive on the front if you wish. I've also picked up a 500GB SATA SSD, and the reason for doing that is purely aesthetic. This case has two SATA M.2 SSD mounting points. There's one on the top, which is out of view, but also there's one on full display over to the right of the motherboard. And I feel just leaving that space empty isn't going to look great. So I picked up a SATA drive that I think looks great. It's from Kingston, the KC600, in black and white, and I think is going to fit well with the theme of our build. Going on to the case fans, this case supports up to four 120mm case fans. One on the front, one on the rear, and two below the GPU. Now the problem with the fans below the GPU is that they're literally touching the GPU. And I don't know whether that actually helps with the temperatures at all. And other reviews have actually said it can hinder with the temperatures. And again, this may be something I test in the future. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put two case fans into this build, one at the front, and one up the rear and leave the fans out below the GPU for now. Okay, so that's all the parts. Let's get on with the build. So the first thing I like to do in any build is to prepare the case. So that involves removing any panels or dust filters that are going to get in the way during the build. So to remove the front panel, you just put your hand under here and pull it forward and it'll lift right off. There's a dust filter for the front intake fan and we just need to push back on these little clips and then it should just swing out. The timber glass panel simply just pulls off. There's a little edge here, and if you just pull, it comes right off. The rear panel comes off in exactly the same way. There's a little edge at the back here, and if we just pull forward, it'll lift straight off. And again, the top panel just lifts straight off. There's little edges on the back here, and just lift up. While I am a big fan of the design of this case, there is one really strange design choice. 
And I will have a look down the bottom of the case. There's actually no dust filter on the bottom. And this is going to be an intake, regardless of whether or not you decide to occupy the bottom fan mounting slots. The GPU is going to intake air through here. And having it unfiltered doesn't make any sense. So I have picked up a separate magnetic dust filter. I'll put a link to that in the description. And I would recommend you add this in at the end of the build. Okay, so that's the case prepared. Next thing to do is have a look at the motherboard. This is our motherboard and our CPU is going to go into this socket here in the center of the motherboard. Now I want to have a closer look at the socket. So we look really closely at the socket. You'll notice the top left hand corner has a white mark on the motherboard. And there's also a little triangle on this corner of the socket itself. And none of the other corners of the socket have those markings on it. And this mark is to help us line our CPU up in the socket in the right orientation. To prepare the motherboard to receive the CPU, all we need to do is open this little lever at the bottom all the way to the right hand side. This is our CPU and what you'll notice is I'm holding it by the edges. And the reason for that is I don't want to damage all these gold pins on the bottom of the CPU. The other thing to note when you look at the CPU, if you look at the corner which is now at the top of the screen, you'll notice it has a little gold triangle on it. Whereas none of the other corners actually have that marking on it. And if we turn the CPU over, you'll notice the same corner, which is now the bottom left hand corner, also has a little gold marking on it. And again, none of the other corners of the CPU have this marking. And we need to line the CPU up with this marking matching the mark on the socket so that it goes the right way round. Okay, so I'm going to install the CPU. I've got the mark on the CPU lined up with the mark on the socket. And all I want to do is hover the CPU over the socket and let it fall in by itself. It's really important I don't go pushing down it. And you'll notice there it's just fallen into the socket. Again, I'm not going to go pressing on it because I can damage the pins if I do that. To install the CPU, all we need to do is close this lever. And we've now installed our CPU. The next thing for us to do is to remove these brackets that would hold on the stock CPU cooler and replace it with the bracket that we're going to need to install our Noctua NHD 15. So it's just held on with two screws on each bracket. Importantly, don't throw these away or lose them because if you want to change your CPU cutter in the future or sell your motherboard, you're going to need them. So the best place to store them is in the motherboard box. So the CPU cutter comes with a whole variety of spacers, screws and brackets, but this is the kit we're going to need for an AM4 socket, which is what our motherboard has. So it's the grey spacers and these two shorter brackets. You look at the brackets, there's two different screw mounting locations and they're for different AMD sockets. As we've got an AM4 socket, we're going to need to put our screws through the top hole in each of these brackets. Okay, so we just place the little spacers over the motherboard backplate. Okay, and then it's just a matter of putting the screws into the bracket, making sure they're going through the top hole. And then we just need to line the screws up with the motherboard backplate. There we go, and then it's just a matter of screwing things into place. Okay, so just the same process for the top one. So if we were to go ahead and install our CPU cooler, because it's quite a big cooler and a small motherboard, it would actually cover the whole of the motherboard. And then we would really struggle to plug the rest of the cables that we're going to need to plug in. So we'll do everything else we need to do with the motherboard, get all the cables plugged in, and putting the CPU cooler on will be one of the last things that we do. So let's go ahead and move on to the M.2 SSD installation. So this motherboard has two M.2 SSD sockets. There's one behind this heatsink. And we also have a second one just here on the back of the motherboard. So you'll find with most motherboards that the M.2 SSD sockets aren't created equally. And it's exactly the same on this motherboard. The one on the front supports Gen 4 speeds, while the one on the back only supports Gen 3 speeds. There's two other differences to point out between the M.2 sockets. The one on the front has a heatsink and a fan, which is going to keep it cool under load while well, the one on the back doesn't have either. The one on the front as well also goes directly to the CPU, 
while the one on the back goes via the chipset. So if you even if you're only using a Gen 3 SSD like we are, and you've only got one drive, the one on the front is going to be your best one to put it into. But because we have got two drives, we're going to put one on the front and one in the back. So the first thing for us to do is to remove the heatsink and it's held on by two screws here. So we should now be able to lift the heatsink off. We have to be careful because there is a little wire going to the motherboard which powers the fan. So we're just going to lift it up and slide it over to the left hand side. This is our M.2 SSD. You'll notice the gold connector is over the right hand side which we're going to plug into the socket and also over the left hand side the little gold connector is where you're going to put a screw in to secure it in place. So the socket where we're going to put the M.2 SSD is over the right hand side and these little standards are designed to secure M.2 SSDs of varying lengths. So to install our M.2 SSD all we need to do is push it into the socket at a slight angle and just a little bit of gentle pressure till it clips into place. We're then going to get a screw from the motherboard box to secure it in place. And then we can go ahead and replace the heatsink. Importantly, before we do, we just need to remove this plastic protection. And then it's just a matter of re-securing it with the two screws that we've taken out previously. And then the process on the back of the motherboard is just the same. So we're going to insert our drive at a slight angle to the socket. And then secure things in place using one of the screws that came with the motherboard. The next thing for us to install is the RAM and it's going to go into these two sockets here. This is our RAM and it's going to plug into the motherboard sockets with the gold connectors on the bottom. So you've got two gold connectors at the bottom. What's important to note is they're not of equal length. The one over the right hand side is slightly longer than the one over the left hand side. So it's important we line the RAM up the right way when inserting it into the socket. To prepare the motherboard to receive the RAM we just need to open these little clips on each of the slots. Then it's just a matter of lining the RAM up with the socket. And once we're happy everything's in place just applying some firm pressure to the top of the RAM and it should push and lock into place. You notice this little clip has now closed. And that's just the same process with the second stick of RAM. We're going to line it up with the socket. Once we're happy with things just apply a bit of firm pressure and again it pushes down and locks into place. Okay so we just need to line our motherboard up with the cutout in the case for the IO shield and this motherboard has the IO shield pre-applied which makes installation that wee bit easier and then if we hold it in place here and try and get a screw into it. So this is much easier if you lie the case on its back but again you won't get a very good view of things if I do that so that's the reason I do it this way around. So that's our motherboard in the case. The next thing for us to do is plug in our front panel connectors and power cables before we add anything else to the build. And the reason for doing that is the more we add in, the more difficult it becomes to plug the cables in at a later stage. So you're much better to do these right at the start. So we're going to make a start with the case cables and these cables coming from the front I.O. panel are the case cables. Obviously these ports at the top and the buttons aren't going to work unless we plug the cables coming from them into the motherboard. So let's have a look and see what we've got. We've got a HD audio cable which is going to allow the microphone and headphone jack at the top to work. We've got a power switch and reset switch cables which are going to let the power and reset switches on the top of the case work. We've got a USB 3.0 cable which is going to let the two USB Type-A ports on the top of the case work. And then we've got our USB 3.1 Type-C cable which is going to let this Type-C port on the top work. So we'll go ahead and get these plugged in. So our power and reset switches are going to go into this header here. It has five pins along the bottom row and four pins in the top row. And you need to refer to your motherboard manual for the diagram to find out which of the pins each of the cables is going to plug into. So looking at the diagram in the motherboard manual, the reset switch is going to go in the bottom row in the pins third and fourth from the left. And it's the negative pin first and then the positive pin. The power switch is going to go in the top row of pins third and fourth from the left. 
but it is positive in the third pin and then negative in the fourth pin. So when you're routing your cables through the case, it makes sense to bring them through the closest cutout to the header you're going to plug them into. So it makes sense for us to bring our cables in through here. Again, when you're plugging these cables in, another tip, start on the bottom row and plug the cables in first before moving up to the top row. Because if you start at the top row, it's much harder to see what you're doing in the bottom row. It blocks your view. Okay, so we're going to make a start with our reset switch because it's the one in the bottom row. So if I turn it round, what you'll notice is the pin on the left hand side has a little arrow on it. So that marks it as the positive pin. So it's important we plug our cable in the right way round. So the third pin is going to be negative and then the fourth pin positive. So we're going to plug it in with the text facing up. Okay, so just lining things up with the pins and that is in the third and fourth pins. Okay, so the next one to plug in is our power switch and it's going to go into the two pins just above what we've plugged into already. So it's going to go positive and then negative and you can see the positive is the left hand pin here. So we're going to plug it in with the text facing down the way. Okay, so that's in place and we're just going to route the cable slightly around to the side so they're out of the way for when the graphics card is installed. So the next cable for us to plug in is our HD audio cable, which is going to go into this socket just here. So I'm going to bring it through the cutout. So if we look at the cable closely, you'll notice there's a pin missing in the top row the way I have it here. And if you look at where the header we're going to plug it into, there's a pin missing on the top row. So we're going to have to plug it in this way round. Okay, so we line things up, the HD audio text facing up the way. And it should just push into place. Our USB-C cable is going to plug into here, so we'll bring it through this cutout, line things up. And it should push and lock into place. Our USB 3.0 cable is going to plug into here. You'll notice there's a little notch on the left hand side of the socket. And if I bring the cable through the cutout, you'll notice the cable has a notch on this side. So it's important we line it up the right way. This is one of the sockets you need to be really careful of. It's really easy to bend these pins as you're plugging it in. So just take your time and make sure you don't bend them and don't apply any excess pressure if it's not going. Okay, and we'll tuck the excess cable out the back. So just above our USB-C cable, we have four SATA ports. Now we've mentioned we are going to install one SATA drive, so we're going to need to install a SATA data cable to allow your data to be transferred between the motherboard and the drive. So you'll get a SATA cable in with the motherboard box, so we're just going to pass it through the cutout here. There's an L-shaped connector on both the cable and the socket, so it's important they're lined up the right way. And then it's just a matter of pushing it into place. This motherboard has three fan headers. We've got two fan headers beside each other up the top here and one down here beside our M.2 SSD. So the two at the top are for our CPU killer. The one closest to the RAM is for the CPU fan and the one beside it is for the CPU pump header. We've only got one chassis fan header which is the one down here. Now we're not going to use the pump header the CPU cooler that we're going to use has two fans on it, but we've only got one header. So it comes with a fan splitter. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this in now. If you look at the socket, you'll notice there's four pins and there's a little notch on one side. So this cable can only go on one way round. So it's just a matter of lining things up and then pushing it into place. And then I'm going to feed the excess cable out the back where we can plug our CPU fans in at a later stage. Now I have mentioned I'm going to install two case fans, one at the front of the case and one at the back of the case. But we've only got one case fan header down the bottom of the motherboard. So we've got two options. We could plug one of the fans into here and also one of the fans into the IO pump header. We would then need to go into the BIOS and reconfigure this as a chassis fan rather than a pump fan. The alternative is just to use a second splitter cable, which I'm going to do and plug it in to the chassis fan header. So then we're going to be able to plug both of our fans 
into the one header and they're going to run at the same speed. Okay, so again, it's just a matter of lining things up and then pushing into place. And then I'm just going to route the excess cables out the side. So whenever we install our case fans, we'll be able to plug straight into that fan splitter cable. Okay, so the next thing for us to do is put our power supply into the case. And this is our SFX power supply. And you'll notice it's much smaller than a standard power supply. And a standard power supply won't fit in this case. We've got a fully modular power supply, which means that none of our cables are plugged in. And the big advantage for this is we only need to plug the cables in, which we're going to need for the build. In non-modular power supplies, all the cables are plugged in. So even if you're not going to use them, you've got lots of cables to manage. And this case is particularly difficult for cable management. Okay, so we'll go ahead and plug the cables that we're going to need in. So the first is our 24 pin power supply cable which is going to go in here, so we'll line things up. We're going to need one 8-pin connector for the CPU. It says Type 4 on the other one end, and the other end says CPU, so don't mix those up. The Type 4 is going to go into the power supply, so we're going to plug this into the bottom row. As our graphics card only takes one 6-pin and one 8-pin connector, one PCI cable is going to do us, so we'll plug that into the next slot along. And then the last cable we're going to need is a SATA power cable, so we'll go ahead and plug this into here. So a question I'm often asked when it comes to the SATA power cable is, that you'll notice this cable has four different connectors on it, and people ask me which one of these should I use. The answer is it doesn't matter. Each of them is equal and will provide exactly the same amount of power. So we can actually power four drives with this one cable if we wanted to. We're only going to need to use one of them because we've only got one SATA drive for the build. Okay, we'll go ahead and get the power supply into the case. Okay, so our power supply is going to go in the top right-hand corner of the case. Important to note, the top panel is solid. And as our power supply has an intake fan, we want to install it with the fan facing down into the case. If you install it the wrong way around and the fan's up against the top, you're going to have problems with overheating. Okay, so all we need to do is slide this into the top here. And then we just need to secure things in place with the four screws that come in our motherboard box. So the case does come with a power cable extension on it, so we need to go ahead and plug this in. And then again, I'm just going to make sure the power supply is turned on because it, there's no switch at the back of the case to actually turn it on. It's, once we put the panel on here, the switch is going to be hidden away. Okay, so before I come on to plug the power cables in, I want to talk a little bit about the power cables specifically with this case because this is not my first build in this case. And the most difficult bit of my previous build was to do with the power cables. And that's for a number of reasons. Firstly, the power cables that come with this SFX power supply are quite short in length. So if you do want to route them up the top and there is a cable cutout on the top, down the back, in through the cutouts, the cables are too short to do that. So you're going to struggle. There's two ways you can do it. You can get longer custom cables, which is quite an expensive way of doing it, or you can add power cable extensions. And for those of you familiar with most of my builds, you'll know that cable extensions is what I will use in most of them. But this was an absolute nightmare in this case. The power cable extensions are quite bulky, and closing the back panel was incredibly difficult. Also getting them all rooted in the top of the case, there is space, but it's incredibly tight. And I must have spent two, three hours trying to route all these cables and get the back panels closed, and it was an absolute nightmare. And in the end, I had to route a lot of the cables in the case rather than bringing them through the ideal cutout closest to their individual socket. So I think if you do want to go down the custom cable route, you're much better going with full custom cables than you are with cable extensions. The other thing, if we have a look at the front panel of the case, you'll notice there's a little dark cutout. And this is designed to hide the cables coming from the power supply. So Lee and Lee aren't expecting you to route all these power cables. They know you're going to use an SFX power supply with short cables, and they aren't expecting you to route all these cables out the back and back in. They're designed to be routed directly from the power supply in the main case to their headers. 
and this dark tint on the tempered glass panel will hide the cables. Okay, so the first cable that I'm going to route is our CPU power cable, which is going to plug into this header here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to route it through this first cutout here. Bring it back in this one. And then plug it into this header on the top left hand side of the motherboard. It's important that I line the notches up correctly on the cable and on the socket. There we go, so it's clicked and locked into place. Okay, the next thing for us to plug in is our 24 pin power supply cable, which is this one here, and it's going to plug into this socket here. Again, making sure I've got the notches lined up the correct way. I'm just going to push, and again, it will lock into place. And then I'm just going to push the excess cable up to the top here. So we are going to plug this cable into our graphics card, which is going to be down here. So that's fine where it is for now. Which means the last cable for us to route is our SATA cable. So this one I know from previous it will reach if I route it up the back, down and come in back in through this little cutout to where our cable is going to go. Okay, so I'm just going to route this cable up the top of the case. Okay, and then I'm going to bring it down through this cutout at the top. And then I can route the cable down here and in through here. So it's going to plug into our SSD on the other side. So we've got the two cables we need for our SSD, so let's go ahead and get it installed. Okay, so this is our SATA SSD, and before we go ahead and install it, I want to point out a couple of features. Okay, so what you'll notice is there's two gold connectors on the top of the drive. They're both L-shaped. There's a long one and a short one. So the short one is for our SATA data cable, so this is where the cable that we plugged into our motherboard is going to go, whereas the long one is for the SATA power, and this is going to go from the cable coming from our power supply. Okay, so our drive is going to be secured in the case with these rubber mounts and screws which are going to come with our case. So we feed the screw into the rubber mount and I'm just going to tighten it very loosely for the moment and we'll tighten it up later once we install the drive into the case. So there's just one for each corner. Okay, we'll go ahead and get the drive into the case. Okay, so this thumb screw here holds the drive in place so we're just going to go ahead and remove it to start with. Okay, and then our drive is just going to go in through these slots here and the little rubber connectors are going to hold it in place. Before we put our drive up, it's probably easier to plug the cables in first. Okay, so you can already see our SATA power cable poking through the corner. So we're just going to check the L-shaped connectors are around the right way, which they are, and I'm going to push it into place. And then I'm going to feed the SATA data cable through. And again, just a matter of checking the L-shaped connectors are around the right way and then pushing into place. Okay, so now we want to just lift the drive up and line it up with the little cutout. And then we want the little rubber bits just to be pushed down into place. Okay, we can just go ahead and put the thumb screw back on, which prevents the drive from being removed. And then I'm just gonna give these four screws at the back of the case a gentle tighten. So just before we go ahead and put the fans into the case, I want to talk about case fans and orientation. This fan has a front, and this is the front. There's no labels, and the fans are unobstructed. At the back of the fan, we tend to have a label, and we would have these four bits of plastic. So this is how you identify a front and back of the fan. Air tends to come through the front of the fan and out the back. So it's important we put these fans into the case in the way we want air to move through it. So we want the front of our case to be our intake. We want air then to be pushed through the CPU cooler and exhausted out the back. So it's important we install these fans the right way round. So we want the front of the fans facing the front of the case. Both fans in the same orientation, so they're pulling air the same way through the case. When we're installing the fans as well, we want to be careful with these wires. We want these wires towards the back of the case, the motherboard end, so that we can bring them easily out one of the cutouts. 
It's also important to mention about these rubber anti-vibration pads that you can add onto the corner of the Noctia fans. These are designed to be added to the side of the fans that are going to be up against the case so that they prevent the fans making any noise as they vibrate when they turn round. You can of course add them to the other side of the fans from an aesthetic point of view but to serve its function and help reduce noise it needs to be on the side that's going to be going up against the case. Okay let's go ahead and get these fans installed in the case. Okay so we'll set the fan into the case and then it's just a matter of screwing in the four screws at the back to hold it in place. And again you don't want to over tighten these screws. If you over tighten them they can make the fans quite noisy as they bend the fans out of shape. So if you do have a fan that's noisy it's worth readjusting the screws and the chances are that will hopefully settle things down for you. Okay, and we now can feed the cable coming from the fan up the top and out the back of the case. Okay, so just the same process with the fan at the front. Feed the cable through the cutout. Going to line the fan up with the holes at the front of the case and secure it into place with the four screws. So now we've got the little fan splitter that earlier on we had plugged into the chassis fan header on our motherboard. So all we need to do is plug each of the fans into the splitter. So there's one and two. We're now ready to install our CPU cooler. So we just need to apply a little bit of thermal paste to the center of the CPU. So I normally apply a pea-sized amount. And then whenever we tighten up the CPU cooler, it's going to spread this to cover the whole of the CPU. So next we just want to line the heat sink up with the bracket which we installed earlier on and then we can go ahead and screw things into place. And again I'm just tightening one side a little bit and then the other side a little bit. Okay now that's our heat sink in place. Okay we now just to put our fans onto the heat sink. It's important we put the fans the right way round. The first thing I'm going to do is start by passing the fan cable out the back of the case because once the fan's in place it's going to be much harder to feed it out the back. Okay, that's the cable out the back. And then I'm just going to add the fan onto the heatsink. So we've got these little metal clips which are going to hold it in place. So I just pull it to here. That's the the bottom locked in place and I'll do the same with the top. So that's our fan now nicely secured onto the heatsink. And it's just the same process with the second fan in the middle. So again I'm going to start by passing the fan out the back. Okay that's the cable now out the back of the case. And then I'm going to lower the fan into place. Just lining it up with the same position as the other fan and securing it with the metal clips at the bottom and then the same again at the top. We can now go ahead and plug each of the fans into the fan splitter cable that we plugged into the CPU fan header earlier on. So before we can put our graphics card into place we need to remove the top two PCIe slot covers. The first step is to remove the thumb screw and remove the little bracket. That... And then we need to unscrew the top two screws here. And then the bracket should just lift out. Next we just need to open the clip on the PCIe socket on the motherboard. And then it's just a matter of lining the graphics card up with the slot. Okay, and once we're lined up, we just need to apply a little bit of firm pressure and it should lock into place. There we go. And then we just need to go ahead and secure the graphics card in place with the same two screws that we removed earlier on. And then we go ahead and put the little bracket back on and secure it in place using the thumb screw. Next we need to plug in the power supply for the graphics card. So it's going to have an 8 pin and a 6 pin. 
So we'll start off with the 8 pin cable. And then the 6 pin. You'll notice we do have one spare 2 pin connector, so I'm just going to wrap that in with the rest of the cable and tuck the rest of the cable in behind the front fan, keeping everything nice and neat and organised. Okay, and then it's just a matter of putting the rest of the panels on. Okay, so that's the build complete. Next thing for us to do is flip the power switch and see if we get a boot screen. Importantly, I have loaded a Windows 10 bootable USB drive into the back of the PC. So if you don't know how to make one of those, I'll put a link to that in the description. Okay, moment of truth. Let's see what happens. Okay, so we've got fans spinning. We've got lights. Next thing we're looking for the MSI logo to appear on the screen which we've just got. So that's good. Hopefully the computer is now gonna find our bootable drive, uh, which is plugged into the back of the motherboard. And the next thing we should see if it does is the Windows logo starting to appear. It can just take a little bit of time for that to appear. There we go, so we've got the Windows logo, which means because our drives don't have any operating system in them, it means it's found the USB drive in the back of the computer. So we've got the Windows installer appearing. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to flip over to the screen mode and talk you through installing Windows. Okay, so we're in the United Kingdom, so I'm just going to leave all the sent to United Kingdom and click Next. And we're going to click Install Now. Okay, so if you've got a Windows 10 product key, go ahead and enter it in the box. If you don't, click I don't have a product key. And then you're going to be able to install Windows and enter the product key at a later stage. I've got one, so I'm going to go ahead and enter it in the box. Okay, we're just going to accept the license terms and click Next. And I'm going to want to do a custom installation, so click on that. So what you'll notice, we've got our three drives showing up. So we've got drive 0, which is our SATA SSD, 500 gigabytes. Drive 1 and drive 2 are our Sabrent Rocket 1 terabyte M.2 SSDs. So in general, I wouldn't recommend only having one drive in a PC. I like to have the operating system on one drive, and then if you're going to use games or video editing files, keep them on another drive. The reason for that is if you end up filling up that drive that your operating system's on, it's going to slow that drive right the way down, and your operating system isn't going to run very effectively. Likewise, if you're doing a lot of video editing and the programs are accessing the files, or you're transferring large files between drives, again, that is going to interfere with the operating system running. So in general, I like to leave the operating system on one drive and use the other drives for my files. So we're going to go ahead and click Next. And then it's just going to take some time to get things installed. Okay, we're in the United Kingdom, so I'm going to leave that as United Kingdom and click Yes. And again, the keyboard layout is United Kingdom, so click Yes again. And I don't want the secondary keyboard, so I'm going to click Skip. Okay, I'm going to set up for personal use. Again, over the next few pages, there's going to be a whole range of options. And if you have different preferences than me, go ahead and select the ones that apply to you. So click Next. So if you've got a Microsoft account, go ahead and put your details in now. 
We can create a pin to log in with instead of typing a password, so I'm going to do that. And then click OK. So I'm going to click on Don't Use Online Speech Recognition, click Accept. I'm going to click on Yes, that Microsoft and Apps use your location. I'm going to turn on Yes, Find My Device. I'm going to send just basic diagnostic data to Microsoft. No de-inking. No. And no again. And again, like I've said, if you have different options, go ahead and select them. Do more across multiple devices with activity history. I'm going to click no to that. And I'm going to click do it later. And I'm going to click on only save files to this PC. And I'm going to click on no thanks to the free trial. And then not now. Okay, so that's Windows installed. It can be really tempting to go ahead and start looking at drivers at this stage, but there's a few other steps I would recommend doing before that. And the first is we want to update Windows as much as possible before we do anything else. So we'll go ahead and do that. So we click on the Windows icon on the bottom left hand corner. And then click on the settings. We're going to go to updates and security. And we're going to go check for updates. So Windows is going to go ahead and find all the updates available. Our computer is going to need to restart a number of times during this but we're going to keep checking for new updates until there's none available. So this is going to take some time. Okay, so that's Windows fully up to date. There's no further updates available. So the next thing I like to do is to get all our SSDs to show up because although this build has three SSDs, I would put money on only one of them is showing up. So we'll go over and have a look at that. So I click on our documents folder and then click this PC. What you can see, we only got one disk, local disk C. So we're going to need to get our other two drives to show up. So to do that and get things to show up in the search box down the bottom, we're going to type in disk management. And it's going to bring up an option, create and format hard disk partition. So we're going to click on that. It's then going to tell us we need to initialize the disks before we can use them. So we're going to click OK. So what we can see, we've got disk zero, which is 476 gigabytes of unallocated space. So that's our SATA SSD. Disk one, which is one of our Sabrent rockets where we've got our operating system installed on. And then we've also got disk 2, which is our other Sabrent Rocket 1 terabyte M.2 SSD. So what we're going to do in the second Sabrent Rocket, we're going to right click on it and click New Simple Volume. Click Next, Next. It's going to assign it the letter D, which I'm happy with. If I wanted to change that, I could do from the pull down menu. And then click Next. I'm just going to change the name. and click next and finish. And then we're gonna go up and repeat the same process with disk zero. So right click, new simple volume, next, next. It's gonna assign it the letter E, which I'm happy with. So just gonna click next. And we're gonna call this one. And then click next finish. Okay, so now if we go back to the documents, this PC, we've got all three drives showing up. So the local disk C, the Sabrent Rocket, and the Kingston KC600. So we've now got all three drives ready to use. The next thing I want to do is install any drivers that we're going to need. So we're going to get these from a variety of places, but we're going to start over at MSI's web page. So don't worry about trying to remember the links. I'm going to put all the links that I use in the description.
Okay, so the first thing over in the support page is the BIOS. So we may update this later. It seems a fairly recent version, the 31st of the 8th, 2020. And this motherboard has been out for a while. So the chances are we'll have an older version of the BIOS. So we'll go ahead and download this by clicking on this button here. And we're going to click on save. Okay, so that's finished downloading. So what we'll do, if we go over to this PC and click on the downloads, and we'll click on the file that's been downloaded. So this is the file that we're going to want here. So I'm going to copy this and go back and put this onto a USB drive, which I have plugged into the computer. Okay, so we're going to use this later on when we go into the BIOS. Okay, so we'll click on the next tab, which is the drivers. So let's see what drivers are available. So we need to click on our operating system, which is Windows 10 64-bit. And we'll have a look at all the drivers that are available for us. Okay, so the first driver, the AM4 RAID driver, we're not going to use this, so we don't need to download it. There's the AMD chipset driver. Um, I prefer to get this directly from AMD, so I'll, I'll do this after we leave this page. The onboard VGA drivers, we've got a dedicated graphics card, so we're not going to use the onboard graphics, so again, we don't need to do this. The next lot of drivers are probably worth downloading, so we'll go ahead and download these. And we're going to click Open. And then we're going to click on the Intel Bluetooth. Click Next, accept the terms, Next, and we're going to go for a typical install and click on Install. Click Yes. And click Finish. Okay, we'll go ahead and download the Wi-Fi drivers. Click Open. Click on the installer, and then we'll click on wireless setup. Click extract all, click extract. And then we'll click on the wireless setup. Click next, I agree, install, click yes. And then click Finish. Okay, and we'll go ahead and install the Ethernet drivers as well. So we'll download these. Click Open. Click on Setup. Click Yes. Next, install. Click finish. Okay, and then we've got onboard audio drivers. So let's go ahead and download those as well. Click open. We'll double click on the setup. Click yes. Next. And it says we need to restart our computer, so we'll go ahead and do that now and click finish. Okay, so that's all the drivers that we're going to need to install. If we go over and have a look at utilities, we have the Dragon Center, which will let us control the RGB on the motherboard and any associated fans or RAM that's plugged into the motherboard. Um, as our fans don't have any RGB on it, and the only thing that I want to change is the RAM, 
I'm going to get that directly from the manufacturer's website rather than using the motherboard software to change the lighting. So we can head over to AMD's website now and get the chipset drivers. Okay, so we're going to click on chipset. We've got an AM4 and we've got the B550. And we're going to click submit. And then we expand this here. So we've got the AMD chipset drivers here. So we'll go ahead and download these. Click run. Click yes. Okay, and then we're gonna go ahead and click on install. Okay, and then just restart. So as we've got an NVIDIA graphics card, we need to get our drivers from it, from NVIDIA's website. Um, you can get the drivers themselves. I much prefer to download the GeForce experience. So I'm gonna go ahead and download this and click run. Gonna click yes. And then we're gonna agree and install. Okay, if you've already got an account, go ahead and put your details in. If you don't, you can create one down below. Okay, I'm going to skip the tour. And then what we want to do is click on Drivers. And you see the three arrows beside the Check for Update. If we click on these, you can select which drivers you want to install. So there's either game-ready drivers or studio drivers. So if you use your PC mostly for gaming, select the game-ready drivers. If you use it mostly for content creation, select the studio drivers. So I use mine mostly for video editing, so I'm going to select the studio drivers. And you see it's got a new version of the studio drivers, which we need to download. Okay, I'm just going to click on Express Installation. Click yes, and it'll go ahead and install the drivers for us. So it is normal for the screen to flicker during this installation, so don't be alarmed by it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and click close. So that's all the drivers that we're gonna need for our PC to run effectively installed. The next thing for us to do is to head over into the BIOS because we're going to need to update our memory speed. The chances are it's not running anywhere near the full 3600 megahertz it can run at. And I want to check the fans as well to make sure they're running just the way I want them as well. So to head over to the BIOS, what we need to do is click the restart button. And then as the computer is restarting, we need to press the delete key to enter the BIOS. So let's go ahead and do that now. Okay, so it's just as the logo appears, you need to press the delete button, but we'll go ahead and start pressing it now just to make sure we don't miss it. So that's us into the BIOS. Okay, so just having a look at the version of the BIOS, the one we have downloaded is slightly later than this, so I'm gonna go ahead and update it. Again, it's probably not recommended updating the BIOS because if you do it wrongly, you can brick your motherboard. So in general, you should only be updating it if it adds new features that you need or if you're having trouble with your PC. But I want to show you guys how to do it, so I'm going to go ahead and update it. Important, you should update your BIOS before you change any settings in it, because when you do a BIOS update, it's going to wipe the settings that you have. So I'm going to click on the M flash button down the bottom left hand corner and click yes. Okay, so we just need to select our bias. So I'm gonna select this one here down the bottom. And it's asking us, are we sure we want to select this file? I'm gonna click on yes. And then the bias is currently updating. So it's really important during this, you do not let your PC power down or switch itself off because you risk breaking your motherboard.
Okay, so just entering the BIOS again to check the version has been updated. Okay, so we now see the BIOS version is updated to the latest version. Okay, next thing for us to do is to go over and have a look at the memory. So we can see we've got our memory here and it's currently running at 2133 megahertz. We've got two XMP profiles, profile one and profile two, which are both identical. So I'm gonna go ahead and enable profile one by clicking up here. Next thing I want to do is have a look at the fan info. So I'm gonna click on that and then click on the settings. Okay, so as we've mentioned, this motherboard has three fan headers. There's the CPU fan one, which we have got our Noctua CPU cooler fans plugged into. Pump one, we don't have anything plugged into. And system fan one is where we've got our two case fans plugged into. So the first one is our CPU fan, which we're looking at the fan curve at the moment. It's running on auto mode. It's a four pin header, so we can run it in PWM mode. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that and it's running off the CPU core temperature. So, need, so no need to change that. We'll go ahead and look at system one. So system one is currently running in DC mode. Both these fans have four pins, they can run PWM, so I'm gonna turn that on. And then as well, I'm also gonna turn on the, the smart fan mode. And then we'll just have a look at our chipset fan. So again, we've got a whole range of modes at the top that we can adjust it to, um, including a passive mode. So I'm not gonna do anything with it at the moment. We can see it's running at the moment at zero revs per minute. So I'm gonna see how noisy it is as it runs, and then there's options to either turn it up or turn it down based on how it's performing. So we'll leave it as it is for now. Okay, the other thing I want to do is turn off the RGB light control. So I'm gonna go and turn it off. Okay, so that's all the changes I want to make in the BIOS. So I'm just gonna press the X button again. So we can see a summary of what we've done. We've turned CPU fan one from auto to PWM and made it into smart fan mode. System fan one is changed from DC mode to PWM. The RGB light we've disabled and we've enabled XMP profile one. So we're gonna click on yes. The computer will now reboot into Windows and we can check and see if the RAM speed is running at what we want it to. Okay, to check the RAM speed, I'm just gonna right click on the Windows icon and start Task Manager. I'm then gonna click on More Details, click on the Performance tab and click on the Memory. So we can now see our RAM is running at the 3600 megahertz that we want it to, so that's good. Last thing I want to download is the RGB control for the RAM. So I'm gonna go ahead and download this here and click open. Double click on the application, click yes. Next, next, install. It's gonna ask us to restart the computer, so we'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so we can go ahead and open up the program. Okay, so you have a look where my RAM is here. It's mostly hidden behind the CPU killer. So actually I think having the RGB effect on it actually detracts from the build rather than adding to it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and turn the lighting off. The question I often get asked is, why do you buy RGB RAM to be hidden behind a CPU killer? And the answer is simple. This isn't the only build I plan to use this RAM on. And had I bought RAM without any RGB, it's not gonna look as well in another build. Okay, so to turn it off, all we have to do is click on LED off and click apply. And the RAM is now turned off and I think that looks better. The only thing we can't adjust is the RGB on the graphics card, but I think it by itself doesn't look too bad at all. Okay, so that's the PC up and running just the way I want it. Hopefully you find this video useful. If you have, do me a favor and hit the thumbs up button and drop me a comment to let me know that you've enjoyed it. Likewise, if you're not subscribed to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. 
You're going to be notified about the new content that I make, but it's also going to really help me out. I'm trying to grow the channel and your subscription will really help me do that. Again, if you're new to the channel, please check out the other videos I've made. There's lots of other PC related content on the channel that you'll hopefully enjoy. Okay, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.